This is 50 Feminist States, a road-tripping storytelling podcast visiting all 50 U.S. states to interview feminist activists and artists about their work for gender justice. I'm Amelia Freeby, and this week, we're back in New York. From the glaciers of Alaska to the dunes of Indiana, I want 50 feminist states. From the waves of New Hampshire to the skies of Montana, I want 50 feminist states. And when you hear the call, you know so well, sister. Hi, everyone. It's Amelia. Welcome back to the 50 Feminist States podcast for the penultimate episode of season two. I can't believe we're almost wrapping up this season and the conversations that I had in the Northeast and New England. This week, we're back in New York for part two of episode nine, as I'm calling it. There were too many people that I wanted to talk to in this state, and I only talked to two of them, but their work and the issues that they're working on, I felt like really deserved their own nuanced episodes. So we're back, and this week we will be talking to a friend of mine, Red, about their work organizing for the defense of Alicia Walker and decriminalizing sex work. Before we get to that, another reminder that you can sign up for the 50 Feminist States newsletter at 50feministstates.com slash newsletter and follow us on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. That's F-I-F-T-Y Feminist States. That is how you'll get updates between seasons as well as hear all about the crowdfunding campaign that we'll do to support seasons three and four. So again, that's 50feministstates.com slash newsletter to get news about 50 Feminist States in your inbox, or you can always find us on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. As I mentioned before, this week's episode is going to be about sex work, and I think it's particularly fitting to talk about sex work in the state of New York for many reasons. One is that there are a number of amazing contemporary activists in New York organizing around changing public opinion about sex work and decriminalizing it, so it's great to highlight their work there. But it also, I think, was a space in which U.S. culture really saw this turning point around the idea of what was then called prostitution and just vice and morality in general. So I want to start this episode with a little history lesson and a conversation about a man named Anthony Comstock, because he did a lot of work in New York itself that influenced the entire nation throughout the mid 19th century. Anthony Comstock was living in New York and New Jersey in the middle of the 19th century. And in 1873, he created something called the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. He used that society to kind of catapult himself into national politics and later in 1873, he successfully influenced Congress to pass something called the Comstock Law, which made illegal the delivery of anything considered, quote, obscene, lewd, or lascivious by U.S. mail. So what were these obscene, lewd, or lascivious things? Well, they included anything that talked about abortion, anything that talked about the prevention of conception, anything that talked about the prevention of venereal disease. And at times that even meant certain anatomy textbooks. So even doctors couldn't order by mail textbooks that they may need to understand something about particularly, of course, female anatomy. So Anthony Comstock was a very savvy politician and was running the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, got Congress to pass the Comstock law. He even at a certain point was made a special agent of the U.S. Postal Service uh, since this law was all about mail. And they gave him police powers as an agent of the Postal Service, which like, who knew USPS people could get police powers, but that meant that he had the right to carry a weapon. So he used that power to prosecute widely, zealously people who he suspected of public distribution of these obscene, lewd, or lascivious materials. That meant that he was often expressly targeting people who distributed pornography, but also people who were trying to share materials about abortions or preventing conception or STDs and SDIs. You can also imagine that as a part of this crusade, and I think we could very rightfully call it a crusade in all of the meanings of that word, he went very Fahrenheit 451 and destroyed over 15 tons of books under the justification that, quote, books are feeders for brothels. 
I don't think there's enough time in this podcast to break down all of the things that are wrong with that statement. But I bring up all of this history to say that New York is a particularly important place, I think, to talk about sex work, to talk about organizing around sex work, to talk about decriminalizing sex work, because it was in a certain sense, the home of the Comstock laws that stayed on the books in so many states until the 1950s and 60s and 70s when organizers fought for birth control to be legal. So this one man who lived in New York had such a strong influence on American culture and the way that American culture conceived of pornography, conceived of sex work, conceived of books, and conceived of themselves and what it meant to be good or bad in an American sense. So having talked about all of that history, I want to start to think about how to reimagine some of those narratives that are still ingrained in U.S. society. Today, you'll hear Red talk a little bit about whorephobia and the whorephobic person that lives inside all of us as a result of growing up in U.S. culture, if you did. And Red suggests in the interview a book called Playing the Whore by Melissa Jarrett Grant. And I thought I would share just a few questions and quotes from early in that book with you before we get into the episode so that you'll have a sense of kind of where we're beginning with these questions. So when we think about sex work in U.S. culture, as Red will say, we tend to think of two things, either the happy hooker or somebody in chains in a basement or victims of survivors of sex trafficking. Sex trafficking and sex work, I want to be clear, are very different things that should be dealt with in very different ways, but that a certain sense of the moral right in the U.S. has conflated as the same thing. As a result, this has allowed the state to criminalize sex workers as if sex work itself was what made sex trafficking bad and not the ways in which people were literally bought and sold. Sex work is not a matter of buying and selling people, but trafficking people is a matter of buying and selling people. But because of this association between sex work and sex trafficking, sex workers are increasingly policed and surveilled by the police. And this is a question that Melissa Jarrett Grant brings up in her book. And she asks, I think, a really important question, which is how much violence against quote unquote prostitutes have we made acceptable? She says the stigma and violence faced by sex workers are far greater harms than sex work itself. Yet this is illegible to those who only see prostitution as a self-enforcing system of violence. For them, prostitution marks the far reach of what's acceptable for women and men, where rights end and violence is justice. Opponents of sex work decry prostitution as a violent institution, yet concede that violence is also useful to keep people from it. So Melissa Jerry Grant here is trying to raise attention to this idea that we say that sex work is violent, but we accept violence against sex workers. And that is logically incoherent. You can't say that something's bad because it's violent, but then say that to do violence to stop it is okay. And when she talks about prostitution here, she's really clear to point out that the word prostitution is largely used by people who are anti-prostitution. And they talk about how this is, quote unquote, the world's oldest profession. But that word entered the English language in the 16th century, not even as a noun describing a person, but actually as a verb, meaning to set something up for sale. And really, it wasn't until the 19th century that the prostitute as a person became an idea who became this product of an institution of sale that became to be known as prostitution. But really, what she argues is that when we call people prostitutes, what we're really trying to do is transform this behavior of sex work into an identity and as such then transform the identity into a class that can be persecuted and against whom violence can be done. So she prefers the term sex work and that's what will be used throughout this episode. And that term was coined in the 1970s by activist, artist, author, and sex worker Carol Lee. So with this sort of background about why use the phrase sex work instead of prostitution, about these harmful narratives about sex workers that really just support the idea that violence can be done against them and it doesn't matter, even though it very much does matter, as well as kind of some history about New York and Comstock laws that explain why it's particularly important to talk about sex work in New York. Let's jump right into this episode and you can hear from Red about their work to decriminalize sex work with the Support Hose Collective. My name is Red. We are sitting in my apartment right now in Manhattan and we're here having a conversation, I hope, around some of my comrades who are incarcerated because of self-defense, having a conversation around uh, why and and the frustrations of my labor and my comrades' labor being criminalized, um, and the organization and uh, kind of collective action that we're doing to try to reach a decriminalized position that is uh, complicated, not just take the laws off the books, right, but so much more than that. And so... 
so support hose, um, which has uh, it, it's a it's a clever name. I think it was created by a former comrade of ours who's no longer with the collective um, actively, and it's it's spelled in a way that implies supporting sex working people, but also you know your foundation pantyhose wear, um, and that joke is lost on a lot of folks. Um, and so I just I want to have some space for the fact that we are we are joyful hookers <laughs> um, at times um, and can can actually like fight and um, and create joyful militancy for ourselves, right? Um, so there is a joke there and, and people can smile um, along with like raising fists. Support Hose got its start, we'll say active like three and a half years of organizing. And though the moment before it was called Support Hose was this kind of random as- assemblage of folks who'd become really disgruntled with the state of play and sex worker organizing in Chicago, um, and we're kind of meeting again in an apartment of mine, but one that was in Chicago to hash things out, to air grievances, to strategize around what a radical formation of sex working people would look like. So we were doing that. We'd only maybe gathered twice, I think, before Support Hose was born. And what kind of catalyzed that collective um, ended up being the case of Alicia Walker. Um, So my partner had set Google alerts, right, to any article about sex work, prostitution, trafficking, etc., because we were trying to monitor trends in Illinois, media trends, right, about arrest trends. And so we were doing this independent kind of research as a part of uh, a support capacity for the collective. And we were sitting in bed, um, and this would have been three Januarys ago. And the headline read, Hooker gets 15 for stabbing Brother Rice teacher. I'm pretty sure I got that exactly right. And it was from the Sun-Times, the Chicago Sun-Times, who has since changed the title of the article. If you go back, um, we really took them to task over that on social media by writing letters to the editor. But you can still see the original title in its hyperlink. So if you could like, you know, you can see that it's still coded as Hooker Gets 15. And that article is about Alicia Walker being sentenced by Judge Obish for the Self-Defense Act that she, you know, had to do um, when Alan Filan attacked her and a fellow worker. And so that article, we both sat in bed looking at this article. He read it aloud to me and then I reread it afterward. And I, I, I've read a lot of bad articles Obviously, we all have. (laughs) Even if we don't recognize we've read bad articles, I promise you, you've read bad articles about sex workers, um, especially those who are being criminalized for self-defense. And I still I couldn't believe the tone and tenor of this article. It was so shocking to me. It was so appalling and so typical. And um, our work from that moment on was all about Alicia. Our first like action as a collective ended up being a press conference in Daily Plaza just a few short months after that, you know, demanding her release, demanding clemency, um, talking about criminalized survival. Um, and from there, like linking up with and, and forming the defense committee, the Justice for Alicia Walker Defense Committee, which Support Hose as a collective maintains and coordinates. Yeah, so that's kind of the origin is a ragtag small crew of Lots of lefties, um, lots of anarchists, Marxists, unaffiliated leftists that are also involved in the sex trade um, and commercial sex work in some way. And a few trusted accomplices that we have worked with in other labor or queer rights struggles that we've brought in because they've they've proven to be co-conspirators and because we believe in, in sharing space in that way with trusted accomplices. So that's kind of the makeup of the collective currently. Now that we've heard from Rad about the origins of the Support Host Collective, I asked if they could share a little bit about some of their activities. Hear more about the work they're doing now. Initially, there were two main approaches and then the additional kind of work of the of the defense campaign. But the initial like was a two prong approach. It was political education internally for ourselves um, to learn a radical history of, of sex workers, of um, folks fighting for trans and queer liberation, um, fighting against borders. And so we we read everything we could get our hands on and we developed a syllabus. Um, and so we held regular kind of reading circles and community events out of our home in Chicago 
in order to, again, build trust, build community, and have kind of a larger periphery of political conversation um, outside of the collective, but involving other sex working people or former sex working people. So anyone who, you know, was interested in radical politics, anyone who wanted to have conversation around sex work as work and complicating kind of, you know, some of these narratives that we might be getting into, right, which is, you know, you're either this happy hooker or, you know, you're in chains in somebody's basement. Um, Those are the dominant narratives, unfortunately, which do no service to lived experiences of, of folks just struggling under capitalism, right? And so we wanted to have space to discuss these things, to discuss books, articles, films. And so we created those spaces. And we maintained those spaces for over two years. And so that was one of the prongs, right, which that's the political education internally and for broader community. And the second part was like agitation. It was we want to be a visible, physical presence in the city of Chicago and in Illinois. We want to be seen going to visit, you know, our comrades who are incarcerated, um, including Alicia Walker. We want to ensure that Alicia um, was kind of like brought into the collective, wanted to be a part of the collective, which she did. Um, was a part of that political education component, but also had say over what actions and, and you know, the kinds of words that we put out at press releases. So it was kind of a, an education and agitation approach, whether it was press releases, whether we signed on to do other support events in solidarity with other um, radical community in Chicago, always trying to say, like, we are sex workers, we are here, or we're former sex workers, and we're here, um, and we support you know, these actions. Um, We've marched in Palestinian solidarity demonstrations. We've organized alongside folks in Slut Walk Chicago. So just to give you a sense of those kinds of approaches being central to the work that we were doing. And so that's kind of the way the work looked. And then the defense campaign was really centered around fundraising and material support of Alicia and her family and beginning to build a base of outreach to others who were incarcerated with Alicia who had experience in the sex trade or commercial sex industry and trying to let them know, hey, like, this is not your fault that you're here in fucking prison. You've got comrades who have your back. You know, we can amplify whatever you need us to amplify. And so that was kind of the other approach to which is like building a, a very visible social media campaign for Alicia, but also building a very real material support system for Alicia and her family, too. One of the things that I find so striking about the Support Hose Collective is the efforts and energy they put into organizing with Alicia. Organizing with someone who's incarcerated has so many barriers that are put up by the state, requires so much energy to communicate with people who are inside. So I asked Red if they could share a little bit about the challenges that arise as they work with Alicia. The initial barriers were communication. The state with a capital S, wants folks who are behind bars, who are caged, to be invisible. They want to disappear them. They want to isolate them. They want to dehumanize them, right? And and they're damn good at it. The state is damn good at making people invisible, especially, especially women and gender nonconforming and trans folk who find themselves in cages, right? And so the initial barriers to organizing around Alicia's case were communication. Our letters would get sent back or lost, um, setting up email accounts, getting on the visitation list, doing the background checks, right? Like you have to be a certain kind of person to be able to go into prisons and visit in the first place, to be able to have conversations with people in real time, which is so important. It's so vital for organizing. It's so vital for building trust in any relationship, right? Is sitting with someone and being able to speak openly, which you never can do. There's never a way in which we can actually use the words that we would prefer using when we're in conversation, um, unless we're in person. And even then in very coded, very hushed tones, right? Because of retaliation and because of the kind of discrimination that um, she faces inside as a black woman, as a queer woman, as a former sex worker, as someone who killed a white man in self-defense. And so communication has been very has been very difficult. It was a central tenant, though, in how we wanted to approach this, because we didn't just want to be on the outside you know, doing this kind of philanthropy. Philanthropy is a bourgeois endeavor. It's, I'm fine if people get that cash however they can for their, you know, projects or whatever, but we didn't want to be, we're not a charity organization. We don't do philanthropy. We we build radical community with one another and that's what we're invested in doing. 
And what that meant was Alicia had to be part and parcel of those conversations. She has to be involved or it's not what we're saying it is. And so trying to build that trust early on and having our letters sent back or not being able to visit right away, it was really hard um, because we were just communicating through emails, which are monitored very closely by the mailroom inspectors. The comrade I was speaking earlier of who would write to Alicia and who came up with the name Support Hose would have a lot of their letters sent back because they would use the term anarchy or they would draw anarchist like symbols in the margins. And we all know that marginalia is not something that the COs are fond of in, in any of the letters. And so there were so many complications around how we could speak to Alicia. And it did it take a lot of time toward being able to go and visit in person, eventually raising the money to do so, and then establishing a relationship with her family. And speaking with her family is difficult, too, because you're dealing with folks who are also just dealing with trauma and the violence of the state and having a loved one taken away and also like some of them being in and out of work and trying to juggle life under capitalism, you know, in the middle of Ohio, a state which has seen such like deindustrialization and um, has seen like such a loss of jobs, labor and funding and time and all of these things are such huge barriers to supporting folks who are inside um, and their organizing efforts, their own organizing efforts inside, because we we try to bolster that work, too. And in turn, we are bolstered by it. And so those are some of those initial things. I mean, God, I could go into how expensive it is, right, to just write and to drive. And prisons are in the middle of nowhere. They're plantations, right? And like you have to have time off work. You have to have time off your hustle. You have to have time from your family if some of them aren't approved to go and visit. Like all of these things go into the difficulty. And then sometimes you get there and for the hell of it, they refuse you. And then you're you're out all that time, all that money, and and then you still don't get to see your comrade. You don't get to see your loved one. So there are these emotional barriers and obstacles as well, right, that the state tries to, to really leverage against you. And yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. So there, there are a lot. There are a lot of obstacles. There are a lot of barriers. There are so many more for Alicia herself as she organizes inside, as she does her own political education inside. I mean, those obstacles and barriers were with her from day one. If you're interested in supporting Alicia Walker, I'll include links to the GoFundMe page where you can donate to her defense, as well as a petition that you can sign demanding her release. We heard Red talk earlier about these two dominant cultural narratives describing sex workers as either the happy hooker or as somebody in chains in a basement, and the ways in which these narratives are not at all sufficient for describing the work and the lives of sex workers, particularly the work and the lives of people like Alicia Walker, who are forced to commit acts of violence in order to survive or in order to protect their family members and their loved ones and help them survive. We need better cultural narratives in order to be able to take care of these people and to make sense of these instances. One way that people try to make sense of them that is particularly problematic is through the quote-unquote perfect victim. If someone is only a perfect enough victim, then it can be proven that sex work was something that happened to them and therefore it's not their fault and the violence they may have done isn't their fault and we can forgive them for it as a society. These are these sorts of perfect victim narratives that we create in order to fit people into boxes that allow us to quote unquote forgive sex workers while holding on to the whorephobic narratives of U.S. culture. Here Red talk about these stereotypes and the problematic forms of media coverage surrounding sex work, and then describe the specific case of Centoya Brown and some of the problems that arose with a certain kind of perfect victim narrative that came up in the coverage of her case. There's so much inadequate and just devoid of care language, um, and then outright hostile, outright violent language, right, that also gets used. Um, and a lot of it is also just like misplaced moralism, too. You know, um, this goes into the kind of language that people use um, about our comrades who are currently incarcerated um, for acts of survival and self-love or like love for family. The way that cases are framed for fast media consumption are just sensationalized. They're almost like dripping with this like fetishization of 
the horror of the state. And it's it's really gross. It's really gross as it relates specifically to folks who have had to use violence um, to survive, right? Or um, use violence to enable their children to survive or a fellow partner to survive, etc. Um, and who are then facing criminalization and punishment because of that. It does no one any good, and it certainly doesn't do our movements any good to rely on these hollow, just false narratives that uphold this perfect victimhood, which who gets purchased to that? Who gets to be this perfect victim? That's going to always in our current society, right? And in our and former iterations of it and probably future iterations of it until we turn this thing upside down and build something new and better. It's going to always leave black and brown women, trans folks, GNC folks. It's going to leave people out because and again, as like Miriam Kaba and, and so many folks who are who are thinking about these questions, right, about what kind of self does a black woman have in this society there's this exhibition turned into beautiful zine project powerful zine project um, that Miriam is a part of um, called no selves to defend in which there's this like legacy of stories and experiences that this exhibition and the subsequent writing projects brought to light that just highlight how typical it is for criminalization to be meted out against black women, right? Brown women, native women, and folks who don't conform. And so if you have a narrative that is so hollow and is so meaningless and doesn't speak to the way, like doesn't speak to who's actually being caged, right, for self-defense, what is its usefulness? What is it what is it doing except further serving to serving to dehumanize and and like sell short the complexities of our lived experiences as human beings under a very violent system, a system of whorephobia, of racism, of, of poverty, of all of these things, right, that are constantly working toward, you know, our collective demise. Like why use narratives? Why conform to those narratives? Why try to lay them over people's real needs and lives? We unapologetically stand with folks who have to use violence as as the collective, as as a part of as a part of survived and punished. There is no perfect victim. We have to let that go. What we have are situations and circumstances that required violence in order to survive and to protect yourself. That's the reality. That's the reality of living in a violent culture that hates women and queers. <laughs> and like, that's part of it. Um, and certainly like a society that hates black folks, like this is, this is what's on the table. And that's, I think, chief among the work that Survived and Punished nationally has been doing is like saying like, listen to, if you, if you claim to be for survivors, right? That means you have to be for survivors who survive by any means necessary and who are, are facing state violence and caging. Because of that, you have to be with people who have narratives that make you question our world, that make you confront it. Because otherwise, you're, you're, you're just supporting who's convenient for you to support. You're twisting people's stories. You're taking them away. It's damaging and it does violence, right, to silence survivors, especially survivors who have, who who the state is actively trying to silence. I want to point to something that Red said here that I think is really important. In conversations surrounding sex work, we shouldn't connect sex work and violence to say that there's something inherently violent about sex work. There isn't. Instead, there's something inherently violent about a culture ingrained with sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and whorephobia. That's how violence comes to be connected to sex work. It has nothing to do with sex work itself. Now we'll listen to Red talk a little bit more about sex work, and particularly a slogan that you may have heard that sex work is work. Sex work is work. Uh, it, it, it is a powerful slogan because it, it just says what our struggle is so plainly and so powerfully. And for so long, the way that criminalization and the way that the characterization of right erotic labor or of you know sex for 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 pay or all the the various iterations of what what could go under that umbrella term as sex work the way that criminalization is consistently targeted is is always in these kind of like visible forms and manifestations of the labor it really wants to 
just sponge and to and to cleanse, right? Their language. Sex workers and those perceived to be sex workers kind of from society. Um, and, and so really criminalization is the kind of disappearing of the killing of the caging of the disenfranchisement of the, all of these things, right? Of, of folks who, um, have been in and around the trade, done survival work, et cetera. And I think that what makes a phrase like sex work is work so powerful and so upsetting to so many people and so, and so necessary to so many others. Um, is that it centers the organizing around our labor. It centers the the kind of momentum around the injustice of, you know, not having workplace safety, not having unions, um, not having workers' organizations, not having the ability to to speak up about um, harassment or violence in various workplaces or in various experiences or report violence. And by locating the greatest injustice around, around the labor portion of that, it enables us to have a conversation about capitalism. It enables us to have a conversation around what it means to be a worker in late stage capitalism right now. You know, and the, and the phrase is, it, you know, has been with the movement, um, for several decades. And I think, in certain iterations of the movement, right, which is so, it's so different. It's so fractured. It's so, it's, it's many bodied. And again, I'm just speaking as one organizer with one perspective with just the set of lived experiences that I have. Using a phrase like sex work as work has been a unifying call to action in places where other kinds of calls have not resonated as much. And I, and I think that further complicating something like sex work as work and, and using things like survival work, um, and, and talking about the kinds of different, like the spectrum at which sex work exists on. I think that that phrase and that slogan allows for those complications in ways that like, if we were to locate the organizing just around sex, yeah, that wouldn't do the, that, that won't do that. It, it can't, it's impossible to do that. And so, yeah, this particular this particular slogan and, and really the term sex work in and of itself, right, coined by Carol Lay, um, what, in 83, 81, 83, um, a.k.a. Scarlet Harlot, in, you know, was a term developed to try to combat the hierarchy, to try to combat the stratification within the trade and industry. Um, that was happening, right? There's a lot of internalized horophobia, right? Um, like you, you can't not have that. We're in this horrible, horrible country and <laughs> in this world. Like internalized horophobia is something that you fight every day, right? Like the phrase kill, kill the bigot inside your own head. Like, I mean, it's, it really, just because you do this labor, it, it does not mean that you don't contend with those, with that kind of stigma, right? Living in you. And so, I think that a term like sex work, which brings together maybe some of the legal elements of the industry, right, whether you're making porn in a particular way um, that is, you know, legal, um, even though under constant harassment, right, from the state and from various uh, credit card processing companies and God knows who else, right? Or if you're stripping and you're in a particular area where that's okay, or even, you know, the very few like legal brothels we have white, right in Nevada, like it allows all of the labor to be talked about. It allows all the work of sex to be talked about. So the stuff that is technically legal right now, but faces just intense state violence and criminalization all the time, right? And and barriers to, you know, normalization because of the whorephobia in society and misogyny in, in society. Because even if you're a sex worker who's not a woman, you're automatically positioned as woman in society, which is really interesting. That's a whole other podcast we could like, you know, go, we could go down that rabbit hole. But like this term allows for all the kind of work, right? The work that we're, we're seeking to, um, to have decriminalized, whether it be, you know, escorting, whether it be, you know, different kinds of full service work or dom work or what, what have you, right? Like all of it can be talked about in this way, which tries to at least have this kind of equalizing political, right, space um, for us to, to be able to then further complicate with our own lived experiences. Um, so that's my long winded, like praise of sex work is work. But I think that it does a lot of other useful political movement for us, right, in terms of like, demanding space and labor rights struggle, demanding space as workers 
under capitalism. So like making way for critiques of work um, and critiques of the quote value of labor and all of these things. Um, when you position yourself as a worker, you position yourself in a legacy of people fighting for a better world if you're, you know, a sappy leftist like I am. If you're interested in learning more about some of these really rich questions that Red raised, I highly suggest the book that I mentioned in the introduction, Playing the Whore by Melissa Jira Grant. I'll link to it in the show notes so that you can find it there. Now we'll hear Red talk about decriminalization and what the support host collective sees as necessary for decriminalizing sex work. So decriminalization, speaking firstly from uh, the position of of an organizer within the support host collective. It's a much more complicated, I think, and, and radical set of demands than when maybe some other folks or other organizations or whoever, just your person on the street, if you were like, decriminalize marijuana, what does that mean? I'm sure somebody would be like, oh, just like, don't arrest people and like, take away the laws about it, right? Cool. Or... There's the other confused, you know, individual who will say like, oh, like better laws regulating that thing. It's like, no, that's legalization. That's not what decriminalization means. So first and foremost, there's this already um, kind of confused set of ideas around legalization and decriminalization. What do these things mean? Right, we're obviously firmly for decriminalization. This is something that Amnesty International has come out in support of in terms of a human rights issue and a labor rights issue. This is something that any researcher worth their salt who's looking at rates of violence against society's most marginalized citizens is going to say like, oh, obviously, de decrim. This is something that's being pointed toward in many, many studies that are being led by sex workers, that are being led by sex worker researchers, that are being led by researchers, right? Like all of these communities. Um, when you sit down, you actually look at the real facts and figures of the impacts of criminalization and violence, right, either by the state or by, you know, the state's citizens. Decrim is the thing that's recommended every single time, of course, unless your budget line for your organization comes from a federal government, in which case you are firmly against said thing and you are firmly for the rescue industry where you get to have a buku salary locking other um, women up. So decrim. I think that part and parcel of the position of support hose, and like this was, I, I pulled this thing up. This was one of the first like leaflets that we would circulate. And of course, it has the slogan at the top, sex work is work. Um, and it says, we demand safe working conditions that we determine. We demand rights, not rescue. We demand decriminalization. It's a lot of demands here. <laughs> the immediate release, uh, no, sorry, the immediate end of attacks on folks of color, women, femmes, trans folks, queer youth who are trying to survive in a world that doesn't support them. This includes police terror and ideological violence in policy, rhetoric, and practice. And it says we have the right to survive, thrive. All workers should have this right, free from harassment and criminalization. We stand with Alicia Walker, Gigi Thomas, and any sex worker punished for surviving. We demand the right to live, work, and defend ourselves from violence. No more carceral white savior bullshit. Our labor is valid and should be respected. Nothing about us without us. So it was like one of the first things that we circulated. And then from that began kind of crafting our own ideas of what decriminalization would look like. Because for us, it can't just mean it can't end at taking the laws off the books. I think that's a wonderful step. God, should we do that a million years ago? <laughs> right? Like get those fucking laws off the books. Stop putting regulatory laws on um, people's bodies and the way that they move through space, right? And while you're at it, get rid of borders. These things are intimately tied to criminalization, right? And the criminalization of, of particular bodies in space, right? In public space. This is what criminalization does. It targets folks that it deems as unworthy to have public space and especially to labor in it. So you have to get rid of those laws, you have to immediate, immediately release everyone who has been charged with a prostitution-related offense or prostitution. And we, we're talking everything. We don't want anyone in cages. Um, this is a, a mass, mass effort for the commutation of and the clemency of folks who have been targeted by loitering laws, folks who have been um, targeted by like panhandling or pandering laws, folks that have been targeted with trafficking laws, et cetera. Um, and of course, everyone starts like, here come the pitchforks, like, oh, you're going to let the pimps out of jail. And it's like, wow, let's break down that racist idea real quick. Um, <laughs> and then some far and away, the folks that are sitting inside of prisons right now are folks who are survival sex 
workers who, you know, were sex workers who needed to commit acts of violence in order to survive, right? I mean, like, just to break down what I mean by that very simply. If the general public thinks that there are, like, huge mob rings of, like, sex traffickers that are sitting inside a prison right now, like, you're watching too much television, you need to turn your TV off. Black and brown women, queer uh, men of color, trans folks, gender nonconforming folks are sitting inside right now, and we're talking, like, individuals who have been charged with these laws. Very cash poor white folk, um, cash poor rural white folk. These are the people who are inside of, of prisons, right, for prostitution related offenses, loitering, etc. And we want them out. We want them out immediately. And that's part of decriminalization, right? That's part of our, our organizing toward decrim. Um, and it also means like defunding the police. Our version of decriminalization of all sex work means taking away the money and guns of the cops. That's part of our decriminalized world vision, because who are the armed agents of the state carrying out these criminalizing efforts, right? They're the police, they're the courts, et cetera. Like, we want those things gone. And I know that, like, people who might be listening to this are like, what will we do? You know, and it's like, imagine a better world. I want you to do that. Like, we we actually want to have these very real conversations about what prison and police abolition will look like, because we believe in the capacity and capability of the human imagination to do better. We can do much better. And decriminalization, just like the vision of police and prison abolition, we can put that at a high horizon line. Why shoot for the absolute bare minimum crumb? We already have less than the bare minimum crumb, right? We want a world that values everyone. We want a world that doesn't keep sticking people in cages for acts of survival. Um, And so all the things associated with those acts of survival, whether it also be um, selling and trading drugs, right, using drugs, whether it be associated like theft with like any of this stuff that is tied to survival and tied to folks who are in the sex trade or in the commercial sex industry who who are doing the best they can with what they got, and it landed them in, in prison or jail, that's our next, th- those are the next things to, to go for then to, to strike from the books. Like, decriminalization has to mean so much more. It's a project of dismantling white supremacy. It's a project of dismantling these racist notions of, of who gets personal safety and who doesn't. So it's, it's all of this stuff. It's, it's so much more complicated of something to organize toward. It, and it, it beautifully dovetails with, I think, the fight against, you know, stop and frisk, the fight against, you know, um, the walking while trans um, arrests and criminalization. Like, I think all of this stuff is, is so intimately connected. And so I think that, like, yeah, the fight for public space, the fight for everyone to have public space and to be free from the harassment and violence of the state, those are the goals of decriminalization as the Support Host Collective sees them. As you can tell from everything that Red said here, there are many challenges to decriminalizing sex work. But those challenges don't come only from the sorts of savior complexes that Red talks about or from conservative politicians on the right. Those challenges also come from the left and the ways that the left organizes around labor with particularly problematic understandings of labor and sex work. Capitalism forces and coerces you to labor, right, in order to take care of yourself, your families, your habits, your needs, all of these things, right? Um, And so it it is a complicated position as someone who's particularly on the left, right, and on the good left, um, who cares about sex workers to also have a more nuanced conversation about, yes, so abolish work, but why do you only bring that argument into conversation when we're talking about sex work? So because everybody's all about the union and they're all about worker power um, when it's, I don't know, the teachers or or, uh, plumbers or electricians or, you know. The, the people who are allowed to work, the people who it's, it's respectable when they work, right? We want dignity and respect for them. We don't want the abolition of work for them. We want workers' power. We want strengthened unions. We want strikes that give them better pay and better working conditions. And we want people to go home at night feeling a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment from their work when they're those kinds of workers. But we want the abolition of work when it comes to hookers. It's very interesting. It's very interesting that leftists do that move. Um, And it happens very often. And it's hard, right? Because all of us, if you've got half a brain, um, you shouldn't want to be paid a shit wage and live in a world that forces you to do work that is degrading, that you hate, right? That hurts other people sometimes. Like, 
you shouldn't want to have to do that to just live on the speck of rock floating in this particular galaxy, right? It's absurd. We should be doing so much more. But again, my problem with this, it, it always, these conversations around abolition of work always seem to be leveraged against sex working and trading people who are, who are using sexual services, right, to survive. And so I think we got to talk about that. Do I have a shirt that says sex worker against work? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Do I have weird conversations about that when I wear it? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Do I have different conversations than when I wear my same shirt that we share, right? The sex work is work. Absolutely. They like these conversations bring a lot of inner insecurities and fear and anxiety. I mean, if you've grown up your entire life seeing the horrible representations of sex working and trading folks in like general media and popular culture, the stigmatization of folks who use drugs, the stigmatization of folks who have um, STIs or STDs or like all of these kinds of like swirling, mutually reinforcing um, stereotypes that are then like, you know, blown into a kind of dehumanizing proportion. Yeah. You're going to have some feelings when people are like, yeah, could you leave me alone so that I could like do this kind of work for myself? Mm -hmm. You know, people have this, this white supremacist idea, right? Through, through all of the kinds of layers of, of how this world is justifying itself to try to save people, right? It's that weird philanthropy, like bourgeois idea of, you know, lifting people out of poverty by like putting them in a jail cell. Like, how does that work? Tell me how that works. And so that's, yeah, this is, this is, this is so much a part of the complication of, of talking about holding the position of like, as a sex worker right now, I'm, I'm so underemployed, right? I'm, I'm an underemployed sex working person because of a lot of things. I think Seston Fosta is, is a main factor, right? I think a lot of people are afraid. I think a lot of potential clients are afraid. I think that clients are behaving differently. I think, I mean, we could go on and on and on about that, right? But the fact of the matter is, is I'm, I'm an underemployed sex working person. And so as an underemployed sex working person um, who was previously not as underemployed in this trade, and I work in various sections of this kind of work, right? Um, so always kind of jostling between different ones as the hustle requires. I want work because I, I want to be able to take care of myself. I want to be able to contribute to my family unit. I want to be able to pay off debt and um, that previous, you know, partners have left me in and, and you know, getting a higher degree in education has left me in and, and all of these things, right, and moves across country and, and whatnot. I want to be able to be okay. So I want work in that regard, right? So I'm compelled to want and desire this work. At the same time, you know, as a devout full communist, I'm like, I don't want this. I don't want this. It is exploitative, right? Work is exploitative. I'm sorry, like little school mommy teacher, like your work is exploitative. You're not being paid what you should be. Somebody's determining your value, your labor value, right? Somebody's determining when you're going to be working, what time you have to get there, whether you're sick, right? Whether your kid's sick, whether your partner's sick, people are making these decisions for you, right? And so, and, and capitalism is making them make those decisions. And so it's like work is exploitative. Capitalism is coercive. We are compelled and forced to labor in order to survive. That is the overarching reality that we're living in. I think what this conversation comes down to is to get leftists to everyone in general to chill out for a second and stop trying to deny the bodily autonomy of fellow workers. If you believe that your fellow workers should be safe, regardless of how they work, that has to be a central tenant, right? Workplace safety, the determining of, of, of pay and compensation and hours and health care and access to resources and grievances and these kinds of things have to be part and parcel of our, of our conversation about workers' rights and support for, for everyone. And that includes folks whose labor makes you feel uncomfortable because you expect sex for free, specifically. I'm just going to put that there. I'm going to leave that on the table. Or if you have bizarre ideas about the role of sex and intimacy in these things, like I hate to break it to you, there's nothing inherently sacred about a sexual act. We don't live in a world in which many things are sacred. And so it's like this idea that someone shouldn't be able to support themselves and take care of themselves in whatever way, shape, form they can. That's, that, I have no time for that.
One of the things that I've taken away time and time again from Red's work and from Melissa Jeergrant's book, Playing the Whore, is that we have to listen to sex workers and hear what they need anytime that we are talking about them. Uh, we should be talking to them more so than about them. So I asked Red what non-sex working folks can be doing to help sex workers and to help decriminalize sex work. In the here and now, I think that locating the conversations around worker power, um, around workers' organization for safety, um, I think that those are vital conversations. And that's where we need people at. We need people to be with us on that page. But that means respecting bodily autonomy and self-determination, that it has to mean those things. If you give a shit about people having access to like safety and, and resources and bodily autonomy and, and all these things that we've been talking about, right? This should be, that should be the first thing that you do. You know, you should be listening. You should be learning from, um, I need everyone. There's homework. Um, you have to read playing the whore by Melissa Gira Grant, and you have to read revolting prostitutes, the fight for sex workers rights by Juno Mack and Molly Smith. Those things should be required reading brilliant takedowns of the rescue industry of, of criminalization of violence and the resistance movement, right? To that. It's so essential to educate yourself and to be in dialogue with others who are interested in in what real like workers power looks like in the now so that we can we can continue this fight. And so yeah, listen to prisoners, listen to sex workers, listen to people who use drugs, like listen to people who are in, you know, um, alternative economies, right? Like listen to people who are are pointing toward why capitalism needs to fall. Thanks so much to Red for this incredibly rich discussion. If you're interested in supporting the work of Support Hose and the defense campaign for Alicia Walker, head to the show notes and you'll find links there. I'll also include links to the book that I keep mentioning, Playing the Whore by Melissa Jira Grant, as well as Revolting Prostitutes, the other book Red mentions, and the work of Miriam Kaba with Survived and Punished. Next week is the final episode of season two of 50 Feminist States. I can't believe that we're already wrapping up this season. It feels like it's flown by. After that... You'll be hearing from me about crowdfunding for seasons three is four, and I have some very special episodes for you out of North Carolina while that's happening. As always, you can find us on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. Until next time, we'll see you on the road. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of 50 Feminist States. You can find show notes at 50feministstates.com slash podcast and follow us on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. Special thanks to Danielle Sines and Jessica Neria for our theme song. Until next time, wild ones, we'll see you on the road.